I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Tomorrow evening, if the crick don't rise, September 1st at 6 p.m., we'll have a team trivia night here at the museums with a country music theme. The cost is $10 per person, and teams can consist of up to six people. Doors will open at 5.30, so come early and see the World of Marty Stewart exhibit upstairs before the contest begins. Email the department for more information, and I would say check social media and make sure that we're able to have it, too. We are excited to partner with the Mississippi Museum of Art to bring Isabel Wilkerson, author of Cast and the Warmth of Other Suns, to Jackson for our Medgar Wiley Evers Lecture Series. That program will take place at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, September 8th in the Galloway Church Sanctuary. It's free, but you'll need to register online to reserve your seats. You can find that link on the websites of the department and the art museum. And don't forget that their fantastic exhibition, A Movement in Every Direction, on the Great Migration, closes on September 11th. Finally, I hope that you'll join us next week for History is Lunch when Jennifer McGillan from the Mississippi State University Libraries will present Digitizing Legal Records of Enslaved Persons in Mississippi and Alabama, The Lantern Project. We've talked about our partnership with the Mississippi Museum of Art to focus this year on the Great Migration, and we're excited to be joined in person today by Maurice Allen Jr. from Detroit and Sherry Williams from Chicago and remotely from California by Kimball Livingston to talk about that subject. The three served on a committee that helped plan the Great Migration events in this joint initiative, alongside our own Director of Engagement, Michael Morris, who will say a few words about that experience, introduce our speakers, and then join them in a discussion following presentations by Maurice Allen and Sherry Williams. Help me welcome Michael Morris. Um, good afternoon. So as Chris said, um, back in 2020, um, the Department of Archives and History decided that it would partner with the Mississippi Museum of Art to commemorate the Great Migration. And um, for those of you that don't know, the Great Migration saw about six million African Americans um, leave states like Mississippi and go north. And what we decided to do was to use this as an opportunity to mark this historical event by helping people to explore their family history and their connection to Mississippi. But we also thought it would be best to involve folks that have been involved in the Great Migration as well as their descendants in the planning process. And as a result of that committee, it was called the Great Migration Advisory Committee, um, we decided that we'd offer a few more genealogical workshops here at the department, um, that we'd offer some research grants that was probably the most radical idea that came out of this advisory committee was this idea of offering $2,000 scholarships to families from outside of Mississippi and within the state to come here at the state archives and help them to trace their family history. And so we did that. And each of today's panelists were part of that committee. Um, and so we're so excited to have them join us. Um, two of them are with us in person and one is gonna be joining us by Zoom. Um, and so we'll start with Mr. Maurice Allen, um, who is originally from Chicago, but now lives in Detroit. Um, he has his bachelor's in general studies from the College of Literature, Science, and Arts at the University of Michigan. And um, he majored in psychology with a minor in Latin. And for more than two decades, he has taught and led workshops on genealogy in Houston, Detroit, and other cities. Um, also with us today is um, Sherry Williams, who um, in 1999 founded the Bronzeville Historical Society um, in Chicago to, pres to preserve the stories and heritage of black Chicago. Um, and then joining us from Zoom will be Kimball Livingston, um, who is a writer and editor in San Francisco. He earned his bachelor's in English and developmental psychology from Tulane University. Um, and his master's in psychology from San Diego State University. And he's the author of three books, and he's a writer in such magazines um, as the New York Times and others. 
And then more interestingly about him, he is a sailor. And so I'm going to ask him a few questions about his connection between sailing and Mississippi and genealogy. But for right now, we're going to start with a presentation, a brief presentation from Maurice Allen. Help me welcome Maurice Allen. Good morning, everybody. I am glad to be here. I am so glad to be here. Uh, I experienced uh, Mississippi for several years, I would say quite a few years. And just to be here today for this presentation is awesome to be. I'm in a room that's uh, got a wealth of information because everybody in here has a story. And our right, our birthright, is to be able to tell our own story. And so in that telling, we're sharing wisdom. We're sharing wisdom with one another. So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to see all your faces. And uh, glad to see a face of someone who taught me very well. Uh, Ms. Joyce uh, Dixon Lawson over there. I'm glad to see her. So I just wanted to uh, thank you again for having me here. Uh, I've got uh, some presentation uh, boards over there uh, with my family history and how everything started in Mississippi on my mother's side. So that's what I'm going to tell that story of my mother's side um, of the family. And uh, we'll start with a brief video and then we'll have questions later. So I'm going to see if I can do this. And then, how do I start to the beginning? Oh, it already starts, so I gotta slide this back. You can tell I'm not technologically right. astute. It's not yeah. sliding. Is that it there? Well, see what was quick back on. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna have a seat. Thank you, sir. <coughs>
Let's give another hand to our great brother. Thank you for sharing those wonderful photographs and memories. Uh, I'm Sherry Williams, and I'm here as a descendant of those who migrated from Chicago from Inverness and Indianola, Mississippi. So I bring you greetings from Bronzeville, which is a community that largely upwards of 60,000 migrated uh, between 1917 and 1960. Uh, this community is the community that I actually still live in today, some 80 years later after my grandmother migrated there in 1942. I want to talk today a little bit about the Great Migration and what we brought with us. So those who left Mississippi communities not only brought the stories of hardship and terror and the, and the idea of hope and happiness in another city, they also brought objects. They also brought the skills that they had as uh, those who tended the fields, knew how to garden, those who knew how to make cha-cha and jelly and jam and wine and beer. All of these skills also left Mississippi and came to Chicago. Uh, my mom was a skilled uh, quilter as well. So when you think in terms of the migration Follow me along with thinking about not just the physical bodies that left the South and migrated to other places, but the information, the stories, the details of how and why folks left. All of that is what we'll be walking through today in my short presentation. This photo here is uh, to tribute my cousin who passed away unexpectedly last Tuesday. Uh, Patsy Spurlock was a retired uh, educator. She attended Alcorn State University. And her husband, who's in the front of this uh, image, was Judge uh, Willie Spurlock. And he was one of, if not the highest appointed black judge in the state of Mississippi. So both of them. Uh, passed away within the last uh, two years, Patsy mo most recently. And so I want to tribute today to my dear cousins who remained here and uh, kept that thread going, uh, weave those stories between those who were here and those who departed. And I miss both of them uh, so much. The Laura photograph is a family portrait. Uh, at the bottom is my brother Marlon, he was the first of our family who left Inverness, Mississippi, and was born in Chicago, myself being the third born in Chicago uh, from those who also uh, migrated from Inverness and Indianola. So I want to celebrate today uh, not just those who migrated, but I want to celebrate those who remained in the Delta of Mississippi as well. So when we talk about objects and we talk about things that left, what migrated with many black families who left the South. This rocking chair is a symbol of that story that I heard so much uh, at Christmas time and at Thanksgiving tables. I never met my great grandmother, Minnie Canterbury Lampley, but I cherish the fact that those stories about her, her personality, the way she talked, uh, what she enjoyed doing, and the fact that she worked from sun up to sundown, these are all stories that were passed along. But this particular chair was cherished by the family and it got sent from one household to another so that every time someone moved that had the space, it remained on display as a testament of a woman born in 1881, the daughter of a Civil War soldier. And so I am wanting to really have everyone think more deeply about what objects do you have that belong to someone that can prove as a testimony of strength and courage. And this rocking chair is just that uh, testimony of many Canterbury Lampley. Now, what I heard from family members 
was that Minnie was well over six foot two. And I sat in this chair, and I'm five foot three. So I have no idea how she sat in this very small chair. I imagine that her legs would have had to be uh, extended out uh, because it's a very small chair. But I'm so happy that over the years, uh, we've kept up with this piece of furniture. Our family, when uh, Hurricane Camille came through the Inverness area, was very fortunate. Uh, imagine when the hurricane came, it took out the entire block, it skipped over our two family homes and the neighbor's home to the right, and then took out the rest of the block. And so it was so devastating that reports say that upwards of 85% of Inverness was destroyed by Hurricane Camille. So severe devastation took place. And if it had not been for that blessing of the hurricane passing over our homes, it's no way that I would have had this, this rocking chair. Uh, the home is still occupied by family members, uh, the Walker family, and I just found out from uh, our great brother that spoke earlier uh, that we share the same surname, Walker, in our family. So I think we're cousins some kind of way, right? Um, the church that you see, Hell's Chapel, uh, was established by our family. It has on the, uh, the signage here that it was established in 1917, and it actually was just the year in which the property was bought in order to, to establish the church. Uh, it was the first black church established in the town of Inverness, Mississippi, and it also served as the first black school for Inverness, Mississippi. The little uh, piece of document that's at the bottom of the screen is part of the original uh, deed, which is dated 1908. And it specifically says that this property is sold for the building and development of a colored church in Inverness, Mississippi. So again, I have documents, I have photographs, and other things that tie closely to those who remained and then our families who moved on to uh, Chicago and elsewhere. Here's my favorite, these two sisters here. They're the daughters of Minnie Canterbury Lampley. Uh, to my right uh, uh, is Artemis Lampley, and my grandmother wearing the black and white uh, top is uh, Gladys Lampley Sanders. What I enjoyed about these two beautiful women was that both of them had a gold front tooth. And they delighted in smiling and showing how it glittered. Uh, my grandmother had a uh, cutout in her gold front tooth that was a star. And her sister had a cutout that was a heart. And um, as I've gotten older and I've begun to have dental work, I suggested to my daughters that I tribute them by getting a gold front tooth, which of course they were totally against. <laughs> uh, more of the things that came into my possession uh, as family uh, passed away and moved on from the South is this dressing table uh, and this trunk and uh, the other objects in the photograph include a crock jar and the pump for a well that uh, sat on the family home in Inverness. Uh, the story that I heard about this particular table, this dressing table, sat in the uh, bathroom area of our home in Inverness. And when it arrived at my house, it was in 2006. And cousins came over and all had stories about this, this dresser, dressing table. And one that I was told was that my Aunt Nora had hid her cigarettes in the drawer of this dressing table. And her grandmother, my great-grandmother, uh, Minnie, found those cigarettes and she got the worst lashing that she had ever gotten in her life uh, because she was sneaking to uh, sneak cigarettes, smoke cigarettes. Uh, another story I heard about this dressing table is that my cousin, who now lives in California, had a photograph that sat on the dressing table, and it was of my great-grandmother. And my great-grandmother had scolded her about something, 
And she decided, if you look very closely at this photograph, she took a pen and she punched out the eyes of the photograph because she was so mad at her grandmother, my great-grandmother. And then she had to hide the picture. And so when she saw that the dresser was in my possession, she then revealed that she still had this picture. And this is how I got the only image that I've ever seen of my great-grandmother. So all around this, this dressing table were other stories that emerged as a result of uh, my having it uh, brought to my home. The pump itself, of course, many homes had uh, water access in the rear of their properties. And so when water in the restroom was built inside of the house, uh, the pump became part of the testimony of our being in this house. I now want to introduce you to my mother, who has uh, the afro, and her older sister, uh, Nora, who we call Tootsie, and then their baby sister, Minnie, named after her grandmother, of course. And these three ladies uh, didn't come up to Chicago all at the same time. The two older daughters migrated with my grandmother in 1942, but because of the tensions that were going on in the community of Inverness, my grandmother could not dare tell anyone that she was leaving when the migration started. And so my grandmother had someone else purchase tickets for the family, and she left intentionally behind uh, my Aunt Minnie, her youngest daughter, to make it look as though she was going to return. And so instead, uh, she had to break her youngest daughter's heart by telling her she would come later. And uh, this is one of many stories I heard about. The difficulties of leaving uh, the South uh, was compounded by the fact that so many people were leaving, so the workforce was leaving so rapidly that many had to leave out in secrecy. And this is how our family navigated that secrecy of coming to Chicago. One of the things also that I enjoy so much is that the friendships that were forged when those who arrived in Chicago, they met up with others who lived in the same town or lived in nearby towns, and they created new bonds and new relationships and new friendships. And in this photograph, we have uh, Alice on the far end. Next to her in the red top is my mom, Doris, her sister, Minnie, and then my godmother in the middle, we called her Miss Booth. Uh, she was my godmother in the sense that she taught me so many things. We have family members that have no kinship, but yet they are family, they're cousins. So I got cousin Chris today. Hey, Chris, thank you, love. <laughs> I got cousin Michael here. And uh, certainly I have my great brother here as my cousin as well. Uh, in this photograph are all migrant women. All of them came from someplace in the South. Uh, on the far end, with the blue on, is Magdalene Lawrence, and she came from Texas. And these ladies decided it was important that they keep their families' strength together. And although my grandmother migrated in 1942 to Chicago, I'm still friends with all of these families. We all babysitted each other's children. And those who I babysitted now are grandparents themselves. So that's you know an 80-year thread that has remained in our family, which is a testament of those who left the South and made Chicago home. I want to uh, now end with speaking a little bit more about just what it looks like to uh, have family that uh, emerged out of not just kinship, but emerged out of necessity. Uh, those who you have as neighbors uh, become uh, parenting skills, you know, go beyond just the parents. And so I want to acknowledge and salute anyone that has experienced a woman or a male in their lives that took up the role of being kind to them, took up the role of being a parent or, or a loved one to them. And in that, I know that in this image, our uncle, who was never married into the family, but became uncle because he was uncle. And we nicknamed him Killer. But he was 
the kindest, most sweet man in the world. And when I was a young mother at 18 and struggling to get back and forth from work, he made certain that my daughter got picked up from school on time. He made certain that he taught her how to fish. And he brought all of those skills himself also from Mississippi. And so I just want to salute everyone who has had any relationship to this wonderful state, who has any stories that they want to tell or preserve, and any story that they want to celebrate. Thank you. Let's, um, let's thank them both again for that, those excellent presentations. And Kimball, can you hear us? I hear you fine. If you hear me, then we are together. I can hear you and I can see you. So we're, we're doing good. Um, I wanted to first and foremost thank all three of you guys for um, serving on our community advisory committee. Um, one of the reasons that we came up with that scholarship program is because members of that advisory committee um, talked about how there's a financial barrier to come into places like the State Archives to do genealogical research. And so I thought that was just an incredible idea. And I want everybody that's watching to keep an eye out on our website for when we're offering those fellowships so that they can take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and it's just been so enriching getting to know both of you guys. I know it's only been two hours, but I've just learned a tremendous amount <laughs> about genealogy and the importance of doing family research. And I wanted to start with you, Mrs. Williams. It was never your intent to become a genealogist or to get involved in this kind of work. Could you kind of tell the audience about how you got involved in this? Yeah, never I imagined that I would be the family historian, let alone us historian. Uh, many of us know that when Roots uh, miniseries was on television in 1977, it piqued the interest of a lot of people to say, here is the time that I absolutely need to document my family's experience, and especially so for those of us of African descent. And so when I watched Roots with my mom, you know, I kind of leaned over to her and said, hey, I know way more than this movie. And she said, how? You know, so I started telling her. I said, you know, your grandfather was a Civil War soldier in the 12th Regiment, Company A. He got mustered in in Maury County, Tennessee, and then he ended up going to Georgia, and then he ended up in Louisville, Mississippi. And I'm just like, ta 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 And she's like, you need to stop telling stories. And I'm like, no, your mother told me this. And so I realized that segments of our history is told to different people in the family, and I accidentally became a historian. And so those of you who have stories that have not been written, why do we have iPhones? Why do we have all of this technology if we're not documenting these experiences for others to be able to enjoy and celebrate later? So yeah, I became an accidental historian. And you actually went back to school, right? I so did. You get your MLIS. Can I talk about that? Oh my God. <laughs> so never go back to school. No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my daughter attended and graduated from Alcorn State University. Actually, I want to brag about her being the youngest ever to celebrate and graduate. Uh, at, she was 19, and she finished you know, college at 19. So uh, I never thought that she would come to Mississippi because so often we would talk about the heat and the mosquitoes and all of that. But she uh, applied and was accepted and came here on a full scholarship. Um, I knew that one of the things that I wanted to do was connect our family to the house that we still have family in. And often we would just, you know, make the trips back and forth from uh, Mississippi every summer and, you know, come here and was able to enjoy the household and stuff like that. But um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> just your experience going back to school and you prompted me on another question. How did your daughter choose all? Well, with her cousin, uh, who we just uh, lost, Patsy, shared with her that mm -hmm. she had gone there even in high school. 
So experiences for college often is introduced while someone is still in high school. They don't wait until they graduate or are a senior. Uh, and she spoke so well about her experience at college. I know that's why my daughter chose Alcorn. And, uh, but yeah, I have um, no desire to get my PhD. Uh, although uh, some days before my mother passed, I was so happy to graduate uh, from the University of Illinois that I surprised her at the hospital in a cap and gown. And just when I thought I was out the door, and she said, yeah, you know you need to get your PhD. I was like, oh my God. But I went to, I returned to school at age 58 and um, went from a high school diploma to finishing my master's in four years. So I didn't talk to people, I didn't breathe. I just had books for lunch, dinner, and the whole nine yards. But that rich experience, I would not trade it for the world. Uh, I never imagined that I would go to college. It was something that was not on my plate for, or a desire that I had, uh, although I value education. But I never imagined my going and uh, ended up uh, having a very fulfilling college life. And I definitely want you to talk a little bit later about your work at the Bronzeville Historical Society. Mm -hmm. But I do want to bring our friend Kimball Livingston in um, because we were talking about colleges. And Kimball, you actually attended Millsaps College for a little bit, right? Um, could you kind of talk about your family connection to Mississippi and how you got way out there in San Francisco? <laughs> I just wanted you to kind of talk about your family connection to Mississippi and um, how you got way out there in San Francisco. Good, I hear you well now. And my ears perked up when I heard mention of Louisville, Mississippi, because my origins are there. My family was in Louisville by the 1840s. Mm -hmm. And for show and tell today, I propped up the saber, the cavalry saber that my great great grandfather carried when he rode out to defend the Mississippi from the Great Invasion. I was going to ask you about Wow. Uh, we also have the, the guns that he had. And, and I was born in Mississippi early on a frosty morning, but I left at about one left. My dad went back into the Air Force. And I didn't come back until part way through my senior year in high school. I graduated from high school in Louisville. Spent a couple of years in college in Mississippi, and I think probably the best way to use my time today is to talk about the things I'm doing now, but without the context, they don't mean as much. Mm -hmm. When I got to college at Millsaps in Jackson, I was in a box. It was the 1960s. I had a completely different mindset from most of the people around me, and I had no choice but to either never say a word or go to work for the Civil Rights Movement, which is what I did. I worked for the Seven Student uh, Organizing Committee for the time that I was there. I represented SOC, the Jackson chapter, whenever there was a regional meeting in, in Jackson. We did what we could, and we were meaningful for the time. I was a nervous basket case by the end of 1968. King was dead. Malcolm X was dead. Bobby Kennedy was dead. Stokely and Rapp had taken over, uh, you know, yeah, taken over SNCC. Well meaning white boys were pretty much useless at that point. And that's when I got out and went down to Tulane instead. And for the world that I live in, and the life that I live now, my origin story begins with learning to sail at Tulane University. And I rarely go into the things I've been almost touching on now. They're still very emotional. I made a donation to the museum last year, and the process of writing about that brought back a lot of tears that I had been suppressing for years and years. So let's not spend too much time on the fact that I come from the epicenter of northern Mississippi, some of the darkest history of the civil rights movement. People around me were involved in 
everything that went on, for example, with the murders of Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. I looked Sheriff Rainey in the eye. I knew the allegedly Reverend Killen, who was the gang leader. I wanted to get out of that. I lived through that. Tulane taught me sailing. And it was my rescue. I've become an international sailor at this point. I'm part of the yachting establishment. We're very lily white and trying to fix that. It's been an interesting process over the last few years of pushing from the edges from many different directions. And now it is part of the national dialogue in the world I live in, sailing, yachting. <laughs> we are not going to prosper in the next generation unless we fix the racial divide that we are experiencing now. And in community sailing centers all across the country, which are being supported by yacht clubs, which used to be white only and now are only white. Subtle difference, but important. I know in my yacht club, we are not exclusive, but we just don't find many people who do what we do the way we do it and would fit in as members of our yacht club. So we're trying to grow them from scratch. We are making sure that children, black and brown children are exposed to sailing. We're making sure they have a pathway into their teen years to keep sailing. And if they click, if they really fit, they can become instructors in sailing. And at that point, we figure we have them for life. Because an instructor in sailing has skills, has a summer job, a weekend <laughs> job, get fresh air, it's a beautiful life. They have things that they do, they can do that through their college years. I'm going to stop talking because I can give an hour long speech on this subject. But I think it's important for people to know that there is this shift in my corner of the world in this time when there's all this pushback. We had the George Floyd, we had that movement. It was a, an awakening for a lot of people, certainly in my world. And that helped to catalyze what I've just been talking about. Uh, so we're here. I don't have a good bottom line for that, so I'm going to stop <laughs> right here. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you flew down yesterday, right? Down here to Jackson. Uh, Monday. Monday. Yes, I flew in Monday night. And you flew in with an exhibit over here. Yes. You set up. Yeah. Yes. Can you kind of talk about what you Sure. Here? Let me uh -huh. step over there. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Now, what I've got over here, I brought um, some of my Donnell family history. This first board, as I mentioned earlier, everybody's got a story. And one thing about a story is it must be told. If it's not told, it's not a story. So my story starts here. Uh, my parents uh, got me on the planet of uh, February 14, 1956. And uh, so I've got my two-year-old picture here that someone laughed at earlier today. <laughs> and then I've got my parents, <laughs> my grandparents. So that's the line. And then I've got my great-grandparents over here. I've only got six of them because I only have my mother's grandmothers. I don't have pictures of my great-grandfathers on my mother's side. So when you think about the story that you want to tell, you got to start with you. So once you start with you, it just builds from there. Because we get how many? We get two parents. We get four grandparents. Everybody gets eight great-grandparents, and it doubles every generation. So when you take that and you look at, I may not get down to here, where it's the 18th great-grandparents. I may never get there. But I do know my third great-grandparents. And the fact that I know them, uh, I'll just talk about them. I may never know anything beyond them, so I just talk about them. There's a picture that I have of all of my ancestors. Now, these are all my ancestors. I put them on the background of a will from 1830 on my dad's side, where I found my third great-grandfather listed on the will of the woman that owned him. And so I use that as the backdrop to all of the pictures, the images of what my family looked like going back to my great-grandparents. So just amazing stuff. You take it as you, uh, as you go through your own family, 
then you share it with somebody. You share it with that next generation. As you share it with the next generation, they'll do that amongst themselves, those cousins. Uh, when you look at how you're related as, as a cousin, um, I'll look at uh, if I'm a great grandson of the main person uh, in the, in the uh, genealogy, if I'm a great grandson and someone else is a great great grandson, then that'll tell us how we're once removed mm -hmm. second cousins, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I learned that. Uh, I've got my Donnells here. Now, the Donnells are my mother's side of the family. Uh, I've got my great grandfather, great great grandfather back to 1870, and then I've got him in 1880. Uh, in 1870, um, he had a wife and so many children. Well, I found this document on, uh, what is it, the WPA slave narratives of a woman mm -hmm. by the name of Lucy Donald, mm -hmm. which is a variant spelling of my last name, Donnell. Her story is so similar to mine that she's got to be in the tree. Mm -hmm. So when I look at my great-grandfather, Edmund Donnell, married this woman here, Annie Jane Kelly, they had these children. They had my grandmother, my grandfather, uh, he was the 17th child, and I'm glad she stopped there. It was my baby <laughs> father. 17 children. She was 47 when she had my grandfather, and then my grandfather had these four children, one of which was my mother. And you just look at it, you look at the pictures that we used to have in picture albums, but now we got phones. We have phones yeah. that we can just take pictures of everybody or take pictures of pictures and keep those cataloged. Mm -hmm. So this is the way I did this. You can take a look at it up close. Uh, it's just fun stuff. And when you think about how you put it all together, think about coming from the heart. Yes, <laughs> and Mrs. Williams, I got two questions for you. Um, it caught my ear when you were talking about nicknames and you talked mm. about Uncle Killer, right? <laughs> and I think you talked about Aunt Tootsie. Uh -huh. um, have you looked into how you know we make these nicknames up in our families? Uh, do you have any idea about that? Or? Well, for Uncle Killer, um, <clears throat> it was a take on his being a Vietnam vet veteran, mm. and it was to uh, distinctly distinguish him from the others in the family who had been to Vietnam but didn't see the war. Gotcha. Uh, for my Aunt Tutsi, it was a nickname that was given to her by a complete stranger who thought she was a woman that he knew, but I think it was just his Mac, he was, his game was to introduce himself to her. And so he pretended, aren't you Tootsie, you know? And she said no, and so my, my mom was nearby when this conversation took place, and so they teased her about that and, and it became her nickname. Um, I, what I love about uh, my dear uh, brother cousin, Maurice Allen, is that the time that we've spent together in the last 24 hours mm -hmm. is that we are establishing that we're kin to each other. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, we haven't determined just yet how, but uh, you just mentioned another new surname, and it was Kelly. Mm -hmm. So I have cousins, you know, whose last name is Sanders, Walker, and Kelly. Mm -hmm. And before we leave here, we'll figure out exactly <laughs> uh, how we're together. I definitely uh, wanted to uh, speak a little bit about uh, Louisville um, when um, the distinguished gentleman told us about his presence in Louisville, Mississippi. I've yet to visit Louisville, although my grandmother and, and sisters and brothers were born there. Mm. I know it's in the hills. That's what I've been told. But what I did find out from those that migrated from Louisville was that they were on the uh, Mississippi Sovereignty Commission's list, and they were all educators, and they all lost their jobs because of their work with the NAACP, their work with just building uh, schools. One particular school that was built in Inverness, Mississippi, was a result of the Rosenwald Fund uh, in the earlier years, in the 1920s or 30s or so. Mm. Uh, but um, if, if we can, we would probably sit here and realize that all of us are kin to each other somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, we are all related to each other, you know, through humanity, but also the proximity of just being in Mississippi, everybody's kin. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and so I, I thought we'd uh, wrap it up and open it up for question and answer. 
um, with this last question for both of you. I wanted you to talk about, Ms. Williams, um, your work with the Bronzeville Historical Society up there in Chicago. And then Maurice, if you could kind of talk about um, the work that you're doing in Detroit and uh, your book. Okay, sure. Well, I want to say that uh, earlier the room was in a buzz about cemeteries. And most of the time that I do any work about genealogy, it normally starts with death. And that's usually the footprint of how many of us can at least start our genealogy path. And that's what I've been doing for, for many, many years. Actually, myself and my brothers and others came here uh, in 2000 to document a cemetery in Diavolent, Mississippi. Uh, if you're not familiar with that very small town, it's right outside of Belzoni. And it was established by uh, recently uh, freed slaves. And uh, I just got a call out of the blue, and I found that to be the most informative way for me to uh, look at how to shape a tree for individuals who don't have many documents to go on. And the reason being, when my mom moved to uh, Chicago in 1942, she didn't have a birth certificate. Mm -hmm. My grandmother didn't have a birth certificate. Mm -hmm. So they used the educable roles yes. uh, through the state archives here in Mississippi in order to establish when possibly their birth year was. And those roles uh, decided, you know, well, if she was in first grade, she likely was five or six years old. Mm -hmm. And so that's how she created, you know, was able to get a birth certificate done. So this is why I always uh, pretty much start with deaf records and then work my way back mm -hmm. in terms of uh, shaping genealogy. Uh, and it worked well also for uh, a very famous uh, lady whom uh, many po people call Anjamama. And so we know that the uh, brand has been removed, the, the image and the name has been pulled from the box. But those families, uh, the descendants of Mrs. Nancy Green, called upon me to have a headstone placed on her unmarked grave in Chicago. And we finally were able to do it September 5th, 2020, after 15 years of fighting, mm -hmm. just to get her acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So deaf records, you know, proved to be a, a good way to do things. And so that's what I do in Chicago with the Bronzeville Historical Society. I get in everybody's business. <laughs> that's pretty much it. <laughs> Yes. Now, what I ended up doing, uh, and I'll do it on the uh, Mississippi side as well, I put together a book. I've been writing this book for some years and uh, finally got enough information that I could put together a book on my dad's side uh, out of Georgia. Now, his parents were both born in Georgia, but my dad was born in Chicago. And uh, with him being born in Chicago uh, in 1933, by the time my mother moved to Chicago, she moved down the street from him. Wow. So they've known each other since they were nine. How do you get married at 20 years old after you've known each other some 11 years? You have three, well, they had four sons, but they had three to survive. And then you get divorced. And then you stay divorced for eight years and you get back together again. Oh, this is, this is crazy. You know? uh, so I ended up doing my dad's side because I could get the farthest back on his side. I got a lot of information on my mother's side as well, but they had a a little competition going on. He got farther back on my side. Well, no, he knows more people on my side. You know? So they used to do that, but I came out with uh, 100 Souls is the title of the book. And it talks about uh, my family's history on my dad's mother's side uh, back uh, through Georgia, a couple of places in Georgia where uh, my dad's grandparents are both from. And uh, we talk about the 100 Souls. It's been 100 of us born since my great-grandparents got married back in 1901 wow. in Georgia. So wow. I call it 100 Souls. And uh, 100 Souls uh, has just been my, 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 my baby for so long, you know. Uh, and now uh, we've got it available over there for you. You want to take a look at it. I put a workbook to go with it. So the workbook right. is to help anyone who wants to write their own book. You can start out with these pages, the same pages that I use, the genealogy charts, the family group sheets, and the workbook kind of walks you through. It's a little 24-page workbook of the forms that I used to make it easy for me to get through my family history. So that's uh, what 100 Souls is going to do, and then I'll be writing the stories on the Mississippi side pretty soon. Yay! <laughs> that's terrific. And 
you do spend a good deal of time working with folks to trust their own genius. Absolutely. I do that with, uh, I started with the school system in uh, Houston uh, when 9-11 hit. I was working for the airline and I got laid off. I have to eat. I must eat every day. <laughs> so I had to figure out what to do. So I did. And I put together a program to go into the school systems to teach nice. the uh, young people from third grade till about college age wow. how to do your family history. Wow. And it worked out well. I am such a ham, but a ch children's audience is a rough audience. So I had to <laughs> ham it up for them. So that's what I did in Houston. Then when I moved back to Detroit, I've picked it up again in Detroit with an after-school program, so it's worked out for me. I haven't done nice. it recently because I was working on the book, so I might get back into it. You will. Yes. Yeah. Well, at this time, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, Chris Goodwin is going to be walking around with a mic, and since we're live and streaming it, if you don't mind waiting until it gets there, I'd appreciate it. I was really taken with the photographs that you had on display, and it reminds me, I'm a grandfather, I have children and grandchildren, we have hundreds and hundreds of photographs scattered about our house in books and bowls. The grandchildren go through them. And I never minded taking a roll of film to the drugstore yes, or even yes. a little memory card to the drugstore. Mm -hmm. But after I got my iPhone, my children have iPhones, my grandchildren have iPhones, we don't have hard copy pictures anymore. Yeah. And so the point I make is, in legal circles, we call what's on our iPhones intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And you need to be very careful about how you preserve that yep. and how you make certain you can pass that on. Yes. Because everything we own now is either in the cloud or in our iPhone. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you for your great presentation. Yes. Oh, you're welcome. The question is, there's a question from online while we're waiting on, you got one? Thank you all so much for um, all of the presentations. You all were great. Thank you. Uh, to the Mr. Are you related to the Allens in Belzona? One of them, the name is Maurice Allen. No, I got a namesake. Get out of here. I thought it was right. just me and my dad. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I am, uh, my, my Allens are from Georgia. So my dad's family, they came uh, from Georgia to Chicago in the 20s, my granddad and my grandmother. And so my dad was born there in Chicago. So I'm not connected to the Allens in, uh, in Mississippi. Not that he knows of. Not that I know of, yes. <laughs> that you yes. Know of because Denise LaSalle is one of those. Oh, Denise LaSalle is? Okay, yeah. I might have to go listen to some of her music. <laughs> Cousin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that very um, interesting presentation. Yes. Um, I might have missed it because I came late, and I apologize nope. for being late. But um, migration is such a massive topic, mm. and um, movement of people away from them, from away from their homes, is, for most of us, is a sad occasion. Mm -hmm. Moving away from home, mm -hmm. and um, there are all sorts of stories about why we move and where we go to. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, there's so many different reasons why we, why we go, why we leave mm -hmm. home to go wherever we go. And sometimes we have all kinds of successful stories. And I'm just wondering, uh, what, was, what were your reasons for leaving home? Mm. <laughs> Simple question. My reason, well, I never lived here. I, I was born in Chicago, but we left Chicago moving to Detroit back in 1971. So I was 15 years old. What happened was my parents remarried each other. So they had divorced for eight years. My dad was living in Chicago during, uh, living in Detroit during the divorce. And he came back, married my mother again, and we migrated to Detroit. So that's where I've been for 55 years. And it's uh, hard to separate myself from Chicago because that's home. So uh, I've got a four-hour trip that I can make any time to go back and forth. So I don't miss it as much because I can get back there readily. And the reason why my family left uh, in Vernus, Mississippi, was because of Executive Order 8802, uh, which uh, provided access to employment for women and for African Americans in the World War II effort. And so my grandmother found out that they were hiring at Echo Products which is on the northwest side of Chicago. And so she moved up with, you know, initially her, her two older daughters and uh, moved with one of her brothers who had, you know, sent 
the uh, Chicago Defender newspaper to her by mail, which was against the law to send the newspaper, let alone the Pullman Porters throwing wow. these newspapers overboard. But she managed to get a Chicago Defender newspaper and uh, it confirmed that there was a lot of jobs opening up in ammunition plants all over the United States. So not only did she leave uh, Chicago, I'm sorry, uh, Mississippi to come to Chicago in 1942, uh, Echo Products is still around. They make the pots and pans and spatulas that we use uh, in everyday uh, use. Um, but her brothers found out about ammunition plants in Los Angeles. And so there was part of the family that went to Los Angeles to work in the ammunition factories. Uh, when she arrived in Chicago, they were making canteens and um, uh, she okay. said shell casings for bombs and things like that. So that was the reason why she was able to leave. Because she knew that uh, employment was secured because of President Roosevelt uh, creating Executive Order 8802. Hey, Campbell, did you want to answer that as well? To the question of why I left, I was tired of living in fear. There was one night I looked out the window from my house on a cul-de-sac of three houses, and there was a Jackson patrol car sitting there again. Mm. And as I inferred earlier, by 1969, as it approached, I felt useless to the civil rights movement, and I was tired of living in fear. That's why I left. Mm -hmm. I've been out of the South for 50 years. I'm still emotional about it, and I am still a Southern boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. I thank you all for the uh, great presentation you all did today. But Maurice, I was wondering, what sparked you to start doing genealogy? I heard um, Sherry say how she got started. Yes. I'm the fan of genealogies also, my family. <laughs> you know, they appointed me. They appointed me. So <laughs> that's what happened. But Maurice, how did you get started? In 1993, I went to a funeral in Chicago. My mother and I took the train to uh, Chicago from Detroit. And uh, she and another cousin went to the club car while I slept, because I had just gotten off work. And uh, they came back to wake me up to say, guess what? I said, what? We just met two sisters going on the train with us, and we were at the club car. And uh, they're going to a funeral. And so we told them we're going to a funeral, too. And so my mother mentioned Uncle Mac. And they said, McKinley? No, that's not just a name you would give to a Mac. And they said, yeah. And they said, McKinley lies. And sure enough, my mother said, yeah. And they said that that was their cousin. So these wow. are cousins we're on the same train with going to the same event. Wow. I get, uh, once I got to Chicago, uh, I met some more of their family. They migrated to St. Louis from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that whole branch of the family, which would have been my great-grandfather's brother and all of his descendants, and another cousin came up. He and I are the exact same age. He's known Uncle Mac as long as I have all my life. But it's my uncle. It's only your cousin. And uh, so from that point on, I said, we've got to find out who we are and who we come mm -hmm. from. And mm -hmm. so now he and I are like that. Now, you know, we, we just like, like brothers now. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started. And then I met you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you took me on a whole different course. And I saw Joyce's eyes light up when Mrs. Williams mentioned the Ejibu records, um, which are on the digital archives. Yes, nice. yes, yes. Um, I did want to mention that one of the things that Maurice and Mrs. Allen got a chance to do, and Mrs. Williams had a chance to do, was to see the Great Migration exhibit at the Mississippi Museum of yes. Art, yes. which is coming to a close soon, so if you haven't gone to go see that, I encourage you to do so. Um, and as Maurice mentioned earlier, he does have copies of his books for sale. And so, I think that's our program today. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We do have copies of the books um, and look forward to seeing you back next week. Don't forget Isabel Wilkerson, Thursday of next week. Help me thank Michael Morris, Maurice Allen, Kimball Livingston, and Cherry Williams for this Thank you. Thank you.